So thanks for coming. It's it's uh, summer perennial day today. You get a few people down here. It's nice to see faces in here. I'm tired of standing at my laptop here at the desk Aww. month after month. So um, everybody got a copy of the handout. We should have plenty back there. You can always get it on the website too. It's always on our class page. Um, but we'll try to whip through fast and furious. If you probably many of you I see familiar faces know I bring way too many plants in here. So <laughs> we won't have time to probably talk about all of them. But there's a lot more out there and whatever I didn't bring in doesn't mean I don't like it. I tried to get a little sampling of, of everything for different spots in the garden, but uh, there's obviously a lot more outside as well. So um, we are recording it, like I mentioned, so you can go back and watch it. I'll just say hi to everybody who's going to watch it later. Uh, we should do some sort of class like, hey, everybody, you should be here. No, we won't, we'll never do that. Uh, but this is always kind of a personal class with me. You know, my I go back about 30 years now in nurseries. You know, I started probably speaking as a typical male. Love Japanese maples, got into conifers, perennials, yeah, 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 and then over the years it's just built more and more momentum and I probably have more perennials now than I do conifers or maples because um, there are some really cool plants out there and every year there's obviously new stuff to come and, and shop for as well. Uh, the breeders keep breeding things so there's always a new flavor of this and always a more compact variety of that. Um, we'll show some of the newer stuff in here as well but uh, there's a lot to choose from and certainly a perennial for every spot in the garden. Um, the two things you'll see on the list, you know, we'll talk a lot about perennials and everybody knows that's just something I could plant. It's reliably hardy year after year if I've got it in the right in the right location in the yard. Typically up here it's drainage more than anything as long as it's not too wet in the winter. But there's also this term temperennial out there. I play with some temperennials in my yard, but now we go to the zone seven eight range a lot of salvias um you know there's a lot of other plants that are temperennials and those it's kind of a fun name but it doesn't mean that it's perennial some of those things come back in my yard awesome i'm great but i buy that as an annual for me you know some of those trick salvias are the main one um, grow it in a pot if it comes back great if it doesn't i got eight months of flower out of that thing in a year i can just grab another one and do it again in 2023 so kind of watch some of the tags, we tend to keep our temperennials up in our seasonal department and not out with the, with the usual perennials, okay? Um, you know, bees are a big thing with this class. You know, I'm not gonna turn it into a botanical lecture slash turn you into entomologist today, but half this class to me is about keeping the pollinators happy. You know, everybody we were talking before class, you know, bees buzzing around on this plant and that plant, and they're happy for our, the nectar we give them. But part of this is protecting the bees, and if we have a nice array of perennials. This one deals more with summer, but we can find things that bloom in our yard, spring, summer, fall, winter, that will keep our native bees happy. We'll give them nectar and try to help protect the bee population. Um, I'm not gonna whip out a whole bunch of sprays and we're not gonna turn this into a chemical class, but I think if you look online that the big words are neonic. Um, people have probably heard that term. You know, that's the thing we avoid all of our growers absolutely do not use anything systemic or anything with neonics involved because that just gets the bees at some point. Um, we try not to carry any of that stuff for sale here. Um, and if you stick with natural organic things, yes, it will help. But I'll say this real quick. You know, if I spray neem oil, you know, my homemade insecticidal soap, anything that you would kill a bug with, and I spray it on my bee, I'm gonna do damage. So don't think because it's some natural product that it's not going to harm bees. The key to me, especially in the summer, is if I'm going to spray something, A, I'm going to try to avoid spraying in a bloom, which is awful tough this time of year, but I'm going to get up really, really early or really, really late in the day and try to get it done when there is not bee activity, bee activity on that particular plant. Does that kind of make sense to everybody? So I could use the most natural organic thing on earth, but if I walk out there and spray my whatever plant with neem oil in the middle of the day, whatever bees are on that plant are gonna get covered neem oil and, and we're gonna do some damage. And that's insecticidal soap, it's phenosid, it's all the really cool stuff I like using um, because I try to go natural organic. Um, you should try using too, they're very effective, but just don't spray it on the bees, so, so try to do that. Um, you know, it's not just bees, um, and this class says, ooh, look at that right on cue, he's buzzing around. <laughs> um, it's also hummingbirds and butterflies, you know, and I love all three, you know, you may not care for one versus the other. Um, butterflies, sometimes they're pretty to watch, but yes, they have larvae, yes, they eat some plants um, as they're pupating or, or maturing. 
that's fine in my place I'll share with all of you but you know you can choose specific plants we'll talk about today for butterfly hummingbird everything pollinator with nectar is going to be for the bees most of our tags are really good I mean if you look at that tag I see a picture I see a name and you will see the symbols on there with the bee the butterfly the hummingbird silhouette all that stuff right on the tags that'll let you know yes this is a great plant for all the above okay now just real quick before we start showing you plants you know planting yes it's hot you know you can see me i got some sweat beating down here in the greenhouse um it doesn't mean we can't do yard work we got to do it safely i'm up early and i'm up late not out at two o'clock trying to dig holes this time of year but um it doesn't mean we can't plant i think it's yes it's a great time to plant early in the spring late in the fall we all know that but it doesn't mean i can't put things in the ground this summer we're going to make sure we dig a hole saturate that thing with water and make sure it's not hydrophobic or it'll soak up some moisture you know go out there dig a hole grab your hose fill it full of water do something for a couple minutes okay sweet i'm starting to saturate that area you're absolutely safe to put a plant in we're going to dig a hole twice as wide twice as deep if we can add some good compost make sure we've got good drainage on just about everything we talk about today add some good fertilizer uh, which would be the eb stone rose and flower food a transplant fertilizer like sure starts great that'll get my root system going i'll mulch it lightly and it's not that i gotta go water it every single day or three times a day because it's the summer you know if i give it a good drink every day or two that's gonna be plenty here as we go through the summer it'll get some root system on it i'll get to enjoy it here the first year and then off we go for the first winter yes Sorry, quick question. You mentioned Sure Start and the Rosen Flower. Yeah. Would you do both? Or do you, do either or. You know, for me, you know, I'm, you know, Sure Start is our number one selling product here. I mean, we use it for everything transplanting, period. Whether it's a tree, shrub, ground cover, anything we move. You know, if don't waste your money. You know, I have both in my garage. But okay. if I'm planting a perennial, <laughs> I'm just going to use the Rosen Flower food because that has the mycorrhiza, which is the benefit of Sure Start in it already. We still get transplant, root development, but... I've got alfalfa meal, some extra phosphorus, some different things in there that will help me bloom. So rose and flower is a great way to go. And then you'll see the other one is ultra bloom. Now I put something new in, I add some of this too. The biggest difference with ultra bloom is, you know, down here at the bottom, my numbers, I'm 0% nitrogen. This is not about growth. This is about flower and root development. So my dahlias, my containers, perennial garden all this stuff gets a dose of both of these in my yard in march one more time usually early summer in june but if i'm planting absolutely i'd use both of those in there they're both great and just a little extra bloom obviously with the ultra bloom just has a little bit extra phosphorus on there um if we're transplanting dividing you know again i'm moving something home out of a pot into my ground that's okay this time of year you know as long as we water we feed it we watch it i'm okay with that I'm not going to go cleave up an existing perennial and try to move it to a new, new, new position in my garden ever during the growing season. Sometimes the, the contractor's coming, he's going to put the deck on whether you're home or not and you got to move something or you're going to lose it. Okay, well then we'll try to do all we can to keep it alive, put it in a pot, water the daylights out of it, try to save it. But if we're going to move something just because we don't like it there, wait till fall, wait till we go dormant, I can divide and I can move things around very, very easily uh, during the dormant season, okay? Now we'll talk, if you ever come down in the fall, I do always do a class called putting the garden to bed, you know, kind of getting everything ready for winter time. And we'll talk about what to do with certain perennials and overwintering, mulching, cutting them back, all that stuff as we go into, into fall. So that, that will cover at the fall class. Um, you know, we'll look, I'm gonna show you plants here next, but maybe the last thing you know i would mention is is two things now deadheading you know you'll see a number of perennials up here that are in full bloom and if i just do a quick little deadheading i'm going to grab one and kind of show you this is one of my favorites i have a lot of in my yard called blanket flower gallardia they're nice fuzzy little little seed heads on there they're nice and soft but if i have a really good pair of snips like these dram ones we have in the store these are really easy to get in if i sit here and do a little bit of this as we have spent blooms through the summer this plant in my yard blooms all the way till thanksgiving i mean i'm gonna have flowers on a nice short sunny perennial all the way in through the summer so just by deadheading a little bit this is telling these types of perennials don't go to seed quite yet i want you to keep producing flowers and then for me 
you know, I want more of these, so I do want them to go to seed at some point. So typically, later September, I'll say, okay, we still have flowers coming, but now I'll start to leave some of those seed heads so that they do mature, dry, drop, and then I have a, a chance for a plant like blanket flower in particular to naturalize. So it doesn't matter if it's that, Rudbeckia, we can go on and on. If we do a little deadheading, all plants want to go to seed. And a lot of these things, if I do a little bit of that, remove the spent blooms, I will get repeat flowering through the summer months, okay? That would be one. And the other thing, not to turn this into a landscape design class, but you know, think of your yard, you know, in your typical beds, whether we're talking about sun or shade, as kind of layering. You know, I'm looking at a typical garden bed at a home and what do we have in the background? Taller, down, and then a border, right? You kind of try to set your garden up a little bit with heights. We can contrast foliages and flowers and anything that is your taste. It's your yard, not mine. But we can design like that with perennials. You'll see a lot of stuff that will get really tall that we would use maybe in the second layer. A lot of stuff we can use on the border. But sometimes it's not one. You know, when I choose a new blanket flower, I probably don't buy one plant. I get three. You know, put a little mass in or a little swath that it's going to develop into a nice patch and not just one of this and one of that and one of this and one of that kind of thing. So again, it's your yard, but I think sometimes you get a little better presentation if you think of things maybe in threes or some of the taller stuff. Yes, I could have one big specimen of the tall butterfly weed or a red hot poker or something and then I could surround it with a little mass of a different type of perennial. Okay? So if we kind of go through, we'll go kind of fast and furious here I'll try I probably won't be able to follow the handout because I started with A to Z following the handout and it's all over the place in here so I'll go through and show you quite a bit of things you will see out there a lot of varieties of almost all these plants so maybe you know I like orange you like pink she likes red you know there's all kinds of different colors on a lot of these so I don't think that's the only choice out there yes I just had a quick question that when you're deadheading do you always go down to the next seed? if you can you know something like Let's do it. In fact, I'll grab my pruners here. This, this. So this is the first one I'll show you here. This is Agastache or Agastache. Some people call it hummingbird mint. It's a hyssop. It's got great smell. Very herby. That's a, a, one of my favorite little perennials. I have one in my, uh, my little butterfly garden. She asked about deadheading. And if I'm going to deadhead, these flowers last a long time. And this is one that will keep blooming all the way through the summer till fall till frost. So when these flowers go brown yes i can dig down in here and cut to a side branch where i've already got two more buds started or i go down to clean foliage and then we send up another flower from there but hyssop is one you can get taller ones you can get shorter ones uh, this is a favorite of the hummingbirds you can probably tell uh, by the shape of that flower he visits mine quite often but i can get almost any color in the rainbow i mean this is one you'll find out there in reds and pinks and oranges i think this is mandarin yeah, kudos mandarin lots of different colors and a lot of these will have multiple colors on one plant which i like i have one that they call sunset and it kind of opens one color and fades into two others and so you get a really nice array of color that is hot and that is dry and this is one we have to have good drainage we do not want to get this in a wet spot okay that's one we want to keep high and dry if we look at Something like Ulstermeria. Does anybody have the Peruvian lilies in their yard? So this grows from a bulb. You know, it's a little pip or a bulb sometimes when you buy these. Um, you know, this is one of those. I'd probably put this in that temperennial category. My mother is lucky enough to have these all over the place. She's got great drainage. But this typically is not a cold thing in the winter. It would be a wet thing that we lose these. So I can naturalize Peruvian lilies in a great sunny garden as long as I have great drainage, good sunshine, it's not going to get too wet in the winter or sometimes I will rot those bulbs out. You can find these Inca lilies, Peruvian, you can find these in any color in the rainbow. This is a little lavender one we had out there, but there are some other colors as well. If we look at asters, you know, these are just coming into bloom right now. This is a late summer fall thing. Um, asters love sun. Again, good drainage. This is one we don't necessarily have to have all day sun, but maybe half and half is okay too. Um, again, a little deadheading will keep them blooming a little bit longer. <clears throat> and watch the air circulation. If, you, if you've had asters in your yard, sometimes these get maybe a touch of mildew, uh, some other issues around here. If they're overhead watered or crammed in a garden where they don't have good sun or good air circulation, 
we keep this in the open we'll have much better luck and again lots of colors on those too i showed you the blanket flower um you know again these are some chunky plants we got here from Rovia, but if i go the yellow orange red kind of range i'm going to find a lot of different combinations in those color tones some of them all short all easy to grow all great for naturalizing uh, but certainly you would pick your color a lot of them got more yellow in them a little more orange typically we've got all three colors in one of those plants they call that gallardia or, or blanket flower that's a great one now you'll see up top here this one I had a tough time picking which ones to bring, but we have a lot of echinacea or cone flowers around. That's probably the poster child for the, the pollinator. Every article I see written has got the cone flower with the little happy bee sitting on there grabbing some, some pollen and some nectar on the flower. There's a lot of great cone flowers. Look at A, your color choice, and B, your heights. You know, I like using cone flower on borders, maybe one level back but I'm not into the tall. I don't like staking a lot of my tall perennials, so I wanted something a little more compact. So if we look at series like Kismet, or this is Sombrero series, beautiful color all summer long through fall, but much shorter compact plants with a shorter bloom. So this is one I'd never flop or get, or get a little bit too big, okay? If we go just a touch taller, this is a grand, brand new series out from Monrovia that's beautiful called the Evolution Series. This is Evolution Fiesta. The biggest thing with that is multiple colors. I think that's really cool on a cone flower where I've got from pinks to orange to red and kind of they blend in between all the different shades. But again, not a, you know, a foot and a half tall plant, not a super tall cone flower, but I think the flower a little bit different with the colors on, on those, those varieties. You can see a white. You know, I brought in, I can do yellow, we can do bright orange. We've got all the colors out there uh, to choose from. The one that's a little bit different would be these double scoops. You know, and maybe I'm a, I'm a plant purist and I like regular cone flower. This sometimes doesn't look like it belongs. You know, there's no double cone flowers out in nature, you know, that are native anywhere. But these always have a big full flower and the petals kind of hang down. But they are pretty in gardens, a little bit taller. Um, and some people like a little, diff little different plant keep whipping through here we might make this this is one of my faves here mine's about ready to bloom this is a perennial from uh from europe up in the alps uh, called liatra some people call this gay feather this is a big lavender spike a little bit different color mine's big and bushy and about to bloom now but i get big long flower spikes on this once in flower i think it's a really impressive kind of specimen perennial not super tall you know maybe i get up to kind of waist level when it's in full bloom but uh one that you can just see is just starting to bloom right now and i'm going to have a really nice color here for about a month we've got butterfly weed can you see that one popping up there so asclepius we have a lot of people ask for asclepius that's probably the number one thing on the internet right now everybody wants to try to save the butterflies um, there's some really cool Asclepius and I'm, I would absolutely try growing some it's, if I have good drainage and good sun They're great for pollinators, but we do not have monarch butterflies this far north The migration pattern does not come through Snohomish County. So everybody thinks about they plant Asclepius You know, I've got food for my butterflies and everybody's gonna be happy our native ones will enjoy the flower but it's not a food source for swallowtails or other native butterflies we have here so i just want to make sure we know that there's no i've seen one monarch in my life and he must have got lost on a breeze <laughs> and fall way too far north the migration pattern you know someday probably will be up this far with, with with warming going the way it is um and then we have that as a food source and for the butterfly all the pollinators are going to love the flower the butterfly larva it's about the foliage if i have milkweed planted that helps protect the next generation so that's where they will nest on lay their eggs and develop new new monarchs by planting on the foliage okay we've got a little guy called sneezeweed this is another one i have in my yard and i sometimes hate when they use the word weed in perennial names because then you think i don't know if i want that in my yard i used to have a rule for me planting in my own yard if it has a common name with weed in it i'm out because that means it's going to grow everywhere it's not the case at all. This is just kind of a funny name. You could call it Helen's flower. That's the other one they tend to call this. Um, it's a long lasting bloom. This is a plant 
you know, mine are a little older, about waist level. My yard, I've got three and a big clump uh, that I put in years ago. They're just about ready to open, and these flowers last three months. They age and turn colors, but I've got that look all the way till fall when these start opening midsummer. Great color through the rest of the season. Again, yellows, oranges, reds, rusty kind of rustic colors. Nothing in the, the pink, yellow, white kind of color tones. That's a, that's a little hotter color. Leave that one down there. Lots of different Coreopsis. Anybody got Coreopsis? You know, this is thread leaf. Some people call it tick seed. Um, lots of color options on these. And this traditionally was a yellow, orange, red thing. You've got some great pinks, different rows, reds, other colors out there now to choose from. But again, this to me is another poster child for deadheading. If I take a minute and just pop these seeds off, if I tell this plant, don't go to seed yet, keep giving me blooms. This will bloom the entire summer into fall. If I let this kind of start to go to seed, it'll still look okay. I'll, they're not going to go dormant or die back, but I won't have as much color here the rest of the summer. So a little deadheading or bite the bullet and just shear it back lightly once in early summer, you'll skip a week or two and then here comes some more buds and, and we start blooming again, okay? We were talking about goldenrod. You know, before class, this is one of the heaviest bloomers. She had one in her yard. I've got one in mine. I'm ready to pop. But this is, you know, not our native goldenrod. We have a native goldenrod in Washington. This is very similar. This would grow on the prairies. But big puffs of yellow flower. And this is probably the plant in my yard, I would agree, has the most bees on it by far when this is blooming. They are just covered every day when this is in flower. So there's tall goldenrod or we have some more manageable ones. I chose the more manageable one for my yard. Um, you'll see a couple different varieties of, of the golden rods out there. We have red hot pokers. You can see the tall one here with the orange. There's a little more manageable size one, the, the Poco series. But that looks very tropical, really cool. You know, kind of a grassy foliage. Sometimes we'll keep this in the winter, you know, if it doesn't get too tall, but we have these nice little flower stalks you can see just starting to bloom. Those will pop up through that grassy foliage. This is another top of the drought tolerant, hot, hot sun, you know, easy to grow, well-drained soil. This is a plant we would have great luck with in the, for the sun, for the hot sun. If we go, everybody likes sunflowers, right? So we have sunflowers. We carry them up there that are annuals. You know, you get your big traditional sunflower. You get the seeds out of it or plant them every year. Um, if you want perennial sunflowers, we have those too. Uh, this is the one I have in my yard called Lemon Queen. This is only going to get maybe three feet, maybe four feet this year. But when you have an old Lemon Queen, I've got a six foot tall perennial for sun. It's going to have a nice smaller, but a beautiful sunflower look on a really hardy perennial. If I have good drainage again and good sunshine, this is one that we would have great luck long term. Uh, growing in the garden and not having to replace that sunflower every year. This is one I planted for my my seven-year-old. He likes the sunflowers Let's See we keep going here. How about geraniums anybody got perennial geraniums? So lots of cool geraniums around um, you know again whites pinks blues lavenders kind of the opposite of Most of the hot colors we've shown so far, but geranium perennial geraniums. This is one called Roseanne uh, there's Johnson's Blue, we go on and on. There's a zillion perennial geraniums. But this is a really easy one, I think, for borders. You know, whether I have sun, you know, part sun, I'm going to get bloom off and on all through the season. But I could plant these and really create a really nice border that will give me color, keep the weeds down a little bit, um, that I could just clean up that one time a year, you know, in fall. See you again next spring. Um, the rabbits got two of mine this this spring in my neighborhood in Everett, they ate them to the ground. They have not come back up, but I'll replace them with a couple new ones. Uh, but this is exactly the spot I used mine for was, man, what am I gonna do on this little border here where I'm getting a pretty good dose of sun? Geranium's a great choice uh, for one that we can get long, long flowers out of. We have something like cat mint, not cat nip, but cat mint. Anyone grow that, nepeta? You know, that's another one, big mass. This was the relatives of this have been the perennial of the year the last couple seasons where I've got that lavender blue. You can do some pink on these as well, but typically that lavender blue color and something I'm going to stay maybe a little lower with the new varieties, but I'm going to have a big thick mound 
with a lot of flowers. This is another one at the top of the bee list to me in my yard. I think this is Junior Walker. There's too many names now of these and we probably have six or seven different ones out there. But look at your heights again. You know, what do you want out of this? If you don't want tall, there's some really great low varieties now that just keep blooming and blooming and blooming. This is another one. If I give this a light shear that gets a little tired midsummer, up we come again with some more flowers to, for fall, but a really easy little plant to grow. That would be good on the, the drought tolerant side as well. Now lavenders, everybody likes lavender, right? Who goes to squim into the lavender festival? Anybody go over there? I went once and that's the common question is, how do I get my lavender to look like that? Because um, lavender is a great, easy to grow perennial. I mean, it's indestructible deer, rabbits, nothing really touches these. The complaint I hear from a lot of customers is, I buy a beautiful lavender from you, three years later, you know, I've got a bunch of wood and a little frosting of foliage on top and I don't like it anymore. The key to this is pruning. You know, if you've got lavender, you've got to shear it. If these are done blooming, I'm gonna cut this in half and keep it low, get more blooms out that way. But now I have that big dense, you know, kind of pin cushion look long term and not, you know, wood up two feet with a little frosting of foliage. If you don't prune them, you're gonna end up with that, you know, at some point. And again, <coughs> if that's your taste, it's your yard. I, I know there's a lady I drive by in Marysville on the way home from work every night. It drives me crazy because I see her little white picket fence and there's lavender wood to the top of it. And then she has a little frosting of flowers three feet off the ground. And obviously she likes it like that's fine but i'm like just need to prune those back so look at your lavenders you know if you want my opinion uh, you know english and french really easy to grow i mean i don't know that if you've got good drainage um you don't have to water them much you probably don't have to feed them much you know that's an easy plant to grow everybody gravitates towards spanish lavender and you know what i mean when i say that the same bloom but i got those two little rabbit ears on top of the flowers right so those are the ones in the winter that people lose up here. Last winter, I would say 90% of them would have fried out anywhere around our area because the Spanish ones don't do wet at all, which is not gonna match our winter rainfall. And B, they're hardy down like zone seven, zone eight neighborhood. This is stuff that goes down to like zone three. So the temperature got a little cold last year for Spanish. So when you're looking, yes, we have both out there because we're a retail place and everybody likes Spanish too. But if you want to make your life easy, look at the French, look at English in particular, you're going to be much happier with your lavender long term, okay? Um, a couple of penstemons. These are just starting to bloom here too. You can see that one. Is that Pike's Peak? Yeah, that's Pike Peak, Pike's Peak Purple. That's kind of a tongue twister, isn't it? And I think this one's Little Red Riding Hood. Yes, a Little Red Riding Hood. So you can see the penstemon. That flower says what to you right off the bat? I'm going to go in there and hide out when I'm a bee. And I'm gonna like that as a hummingbird as well. So I mean, Penstemon's a great little pollinator uh, perennial. Probably not the longest season of bloom. This is one that we would get a nice six, eight weeks of color with when they get in flower. Deadhead them a little bit, let them go to seed if you want. That's it for the year. This is not one we would tend to get the repeat flowering that we would on some of the other things. Um, we can pick again a bunch of different heights. Um, I've used Penstemon more for the height end of it in my own yard where I wanted to see that really cool flower kind of popping up behind something else you know and that's where i wanted to cite in my in my own little uh, butterfly uh, pollinator gardens last couple on this table anyone done the wand flowers or gara anybody do gara got a couple how's yours have you been pretty happy with yours I have. yeah big bushy yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and that's the, probably the one thing I would say with Gara. A very pretty plant, you know, and again, I can do pastel pink, rose, or white. And I can choose, do I want a little bit of red in the foliage or do I just want green? Those are kind of your base color choices. But Gara gets pretty bushy and some of them, you know, it's a specimen plant, almost a shrub size during the growing season that we would, again, die back as a perennial and start over again the next year. Another one, we have to have good drainage. The places I've tried them in my own yard, let me see how it does here where I dug down, hit some clay, you know, tried to break it up, add some compost. A year or two later, just too wet in the winter, didn't come back. So I've, I've kept these a little higher and drier in my own yard. But I think this one is, is this Belitza? Yeah, Belitza dark pink, which are more manageable <laughs> than our old Gara's. 
Uh, but I think there's room for both. You know, if you've got room and you want a big, impressive plant, this is at the top of the bee and especially the top of the butterfly list. They call this butterfly flower or wand flower. That's a really pretty one. And the last one here from our, I won't say our friends up north and east, but this is Russian sage. So this is Perovskia. That's always a tough one to say. But if I like blue, you know, or lavender blue on those color tones, and I want a shrubby perennial that does get a little bit of wood to it too, you know, this is at the top of the list for drought tolerance, cold tolerance, easy to grow. But this is a big plant. You know, even the small ones are going to get pretty good size. And there's some Russian sage I've seen that get very good size on them. Um, so it's something to consider. You know, this is a plant I see out maybe in the sunny parking strips, a lot of places where you really don't want to water long term. That's an impressive perennial. It will give you some structure and some size and a, and a great summer flower. Um, with the, You're not going to have to water it much. Once these gets established, um, you're gonna, they're going to kind of be left on their own. That's an easy one to grow. Now we'll skip over to this one because then we'll kind of do sun and sun. Then I got a few shade things here too. But if I look on this table, I'll show this one first because we, we mentioned at the beginning, you know, that term temporennial, right? When I've talked about temporennials and maybe depending on where you live, you're a little more worried about things coming back. Uh, this is a, a Gloxinia that I would put in that temporennial category. Really cool looking plant, fun flower, great foliage. Uh, but this is zone eight. This is one that, again, we get a cold winter. I take the chance of it not coming back. If I don't have perfect drainage, we take the chance of, of it not coming back kind of thing. But the main thing we see again in those temperennials are a lot of the salvias. I'll kind of skip over to that one. Who has hot lips? Everybody probably has a hot lips. I don't know what it is about that plant, but I think every gardener has gotten a hot lips in the last five years. This is again, probably our most popular plant out there. Uh, we go through hundreds a year. Who's had their hot lips come back every year? No problem. Everybody, a couple not. I lost part of it. Lot. This okay. Year. Because this is this to me is again a temporennial. So there's perennial salvias like Nemorosa. You know these these meadow sages. You know I could have this anywhere in the country, damn near even Alaska, and I'm not going to lose this because of temperature. I'm going to lose it because it gets too wet, maybe. But this is something super super hardy. Other kinds of salvias, the temporennial salvias. It's temperature as well. I mean, hot lips is right on that line, you know, zone seven, zone eight, and there's a lot of other ones like this that are the same way. I'm lucky I found a spot mine likes. I've had it for years. I thought this winter I'm done, but it came back, thank you, to life again. So um, it's a great bloomer. I mean, if you like, again, hummingbird, pollinator, it's a fabulous plant for hot, dry areas, and it'll get some size to it too. The one thing I would say about these salvias, anything like this, is do not cut them back in the fall. So this is one we walk away from. Don't go out there and be tempted to, I'm just gonna cut you down. Wait till spring. If you cut in the fall, I give you next to zero chance of it coming back that next year. But if you let it harden off and not open up all that wood in the fall before we do get cold, I walked out in April, was like, yes green coming back off the wood everywhere then we cut it back to that point and off we go for the season i've got a three foot tall three foot wide one right now in full bloom you know since june so don't cut it back in the fall that would be that be the same advice for hardy fuchsia here in a minute too that's another one so a couple different ones has anyone done plumbago so that's a really unique perennial to me. This is one that we would say naturalizes. It's not gonna be a clump. It almost looks like a ground cover as it gets older. But plumbago, you can see A, one of those rare plants I can get a really blue, blue flower off of. And this is burning bush color. If you know burning bush red. So in about a month here in the fall, I'm gonna have bright burning bush red foliage with that blue flower. I think it's one of the prettiest perennials for that late August, September into October time frame. So this is another one. I'd probably get three, you know, make a border of it somewhere that you like. You know, if, if we've got a nice sunny spot, doesn't have to be all day sun. I'm gonna get fabulous red foliage color and a good blue, a true blue flower on Plumbago what as about well. What the drainage on that one? Drainage is not, it, it, good drainage is always a great idea. I'm not gonna tell you no, um, I don't want boggy, but that one's not as quite as particular. I got a bad um, area that I've always, working on 
just be careful with that word plumbago because um, I lived for a year down near San Francisco and there's a lot of plumbagos that people call that's a different plant there's plumbagos that only grow in tropical areas that's the only serrato stigma you'll see on that list that's the one we would do up here plenty plenty hardy for Washington uh, I would not put that on the drought tolerant list I keep that on a you know not watering every day but we're gonna need a little bit of water on those as well okay so we got sages um, we'll do evergreen well let's just put them in now so hookahs okay I have hookah itis who else has hookah itis <laughs> I've had hookah problems since day one in plants um, I have way too many hookahs myself I could really shouldn't say this in a pollinator class I could care less if they bloom but they do have a nice flower too um, great foliage and these are evergreen so this is a little different for perennials I wanted to show you there it is this is the difference to me look at the flower of that coming out so this is black forest cake great name for that right and I just got some of these too when they came out last year but black forest cake, you know, I can pick any foliage in the rainbow. Let's start with that. I can go from variegated white, lime green, orange, red, peach, purple, black. I can pick any color I want. But I'm going to look at the flower. You know, this has a beautiful coral color bloom. There's other ones a little yellow. Even the nominal ones still have a little color to them. But you'll be shocked how well, A, hummingbirds like that little flower and bees i mean this is one of my i have them everywhere in borders because i like the evergreen foliage and they are always on these things all through the season they have flowers out on them so but the biggest thing with hooker is to me you know clean them up a couple times a year if you can you know i usually try to clean mine up going into winter and coming out of winter to have them look their best um and deadhead them a little bit with the snips you know the flowers are done they'll go to seed and give you some free plants which i do too but um, if you deadhead them, I'll keep those flowers coming up really all the way spring, summer, and fall. I mean, that's one that nearly would bloom all through the year. My, the crown seems to rise above. I don't yep. know if it's too dry or if I just need to set them in a little well, bit Well, that's, that's a great question on hookah. So, A, that doesn't look like it, but hookah would be at the top of the drought taller list. If you've got old hookahs, I'm not watering some of those at all in some areas in my yard. She mentioned the stem coming out of the ground and then I've got top heavy foliage right so some of that is a little bit our winter they call that frost heave you know it'll kind of get itself out of the ground a little bit it's not the end of the world but like I just about right before the heat luckily I had a huge patch of an old one called berry marmalade and was like okay it's your turn this year dug the whole patch up divided it yeah. and then replanted chunks in there it's already taking back off and off we go so you plant a hooker or two you know I try to get on a three year schedule like okay three years are up let's just it'll take you a minute it's not a not, not a crazy project they come out of the ground really easy you can snap them apart pop some back in you got lots of extra i think i took up five plants i had in originally i probably had 60 plants out of that one patch and it was like okay i'll put back 12 15 small ones oh i'd like some over there too and then i gave some to my neighbors in the arboretum plant sale so you, you can always share share some pieces of hookah um, here's a couple more. So we got something like Monarda. Let's see how we're doing on time. Yeah. So this is bee balm. This is another one. I like to smell a bee balm. I don't know if you guys do. Um, but Monarda is one um, I would say has taken a total turn in the last, you know, five, ten years. Where if you had old Monardas, you got those old tall ones that kind of got wet and they flopped open a little bit when they were done blooming. There are so many great dwarf ones out there. We got a bunch of Monarda again this week because um, I think it's a beautiful unique flower it's got great fragrance drought tolerant again this is one we want to have and again great drainage and really good sunlight and we're going to have really good luck with with Venarda. I'll deadhead some of my little mini purple ones and yes they will throw a little bit more flower out as we go through late summer as well but again cranberry red you know lilac pink dark purple all those kind of tones we can find a really good uh, Monarda or bee balm in those colors. We have something like yarrow, you know, or achillea, you'll see on there. You know, that's another great one for the butterflies. We have native yarrow that grows in our state, a little bit more east of the mountains, um, but a lot of great hybrids of them to grow in our gardens here. If, again, I've got good drainage, really good sun, 
This is an easy to grow little clumpy perennial. I think the bonus with this is the foliage. That's got a great texture, a little bit different than a lot of perennials. And when we're setting up a little, you know, pollinator garden or a little sunny perennial garden, that works really well, A, with flower, but I think it also adds a really nice kind of ferny uh, texture to something for full sun as well. Uh, this is strawberry. This is summer wine. We've got uh, a couple other strawberry seduction out there. We've got yellows. We've got even kind of an orangey terracotta one. But you can find a number of different cool colors of, uh, of yarrow out there. This is one you probably don't see around very much. This is always a fun one too because we can see we have perennials from A to Z. So this is a plant called Zauschneria with a Z. I think the only thing we carry that starts with a Z except zinnias in our annuals. So anyone have a Zauschneria? I lost it. You lost it? It was nice in the rock carpet. Correct carpet, yeah. I've got a huge patch of this I put in years ago, and it is a carpet essentially. If I put this, it's mine's on a slight slope in a rockery, it cascades down, and I get these orange trumpet flowers all through summer, through fall. Um, if you lose it, it's wet. It's probably not cold as much. And this is not a plan I'm gonna go stick in the border of my garden and probably expect it to thrive unless I got really sandy soil up here. So rockery, a little sunny slope, this will naturalize really easily. I mean, my patch is probably four feet across now and about three feet up the hill and it pops in and out of different rocks in there. But when that's blooming, again, the color, the shape of the flower, you can probably guess, Mr. Hummingbird is always on this in, in my yard as well. So they call this uh, hummingbird flower, the deer don't touch it, um, Zauschneria, California fuchsia, I've heard a couple people call that. Uh, this is one you would find native you know if we were hanging out down in like carmel valley up in the mountains this would be a wildflower down there in some of those hot dry areas this does not need much water up here this is an area in my rockery i hardly ever run my sprinkler in and that's happy as can be yes full, full sun. absolutely full sun yeah well I, you don't have to have all day the spot i have mine is it's kind of japanese maple it's right against my driveway when i drive home i get to see my orange flowers but it's shade till probably one o'clock and then i just get cooked all the way till sundown and i'm okay with that it doesn't have to be all all day yeah so zauchneria a couple of rudbeckias i'm sure everybody got black eyed susans we call these so i think there's some really good rudbeckias for yards now this isn't this is the old-fashioned one called Goldstrom. Probably most people have had this in their yard. I have some too many patches of it in my yard. I like the flowers. But this is a little bigger plant. You know, and this spreads, I'll tell you, this is not one we're gonna have a little clump. If I plant a Rubecchia next year, it's gonna be that wide, and then it's gonna be that wide until you tell it with the shovel, that's enough. You know, we're not gonna have any bigger than that. This is one that naturalizes really well. Great drought tolerance. Blooms all summer with those little golden yellow daisies. But Goldstrom's a little taller. You know, I'll have Goldstrom up to my waist when it's in full bloom. If you don't want that height, the last few years, there's unbelievable little short ones. I put this in another garden in front of my house where I just wanted something like knee level down towards shin. This is little gold star. So I have the same look as I want, like the old Black Eyed Susan, but now I've got a much shorter more compact one that still blooms its little heart off all summer into fall, okay? Sorry, it's getting hot in here. You can probably see that. But we'll make it, we're almost there. <laughs> now this I didn't put on the list, but who knows what that is. There you go. So I should put this on the list. It's, it is a perennial, but this grows from a bulb. Everybody kind of seen Crocosmia bulbs out there. Um, you know, this is a really good plant for hummingbirds. I've got some big patches of this. Yes, you will get a lot of them if they find a spot you like. You'll be digging these up every few years and replanting some bulbs. I don't mind doing it. But I can get yellows, oranges, and reds, and I can pick something like the Evil Lucifer, the variety that'll get as tall as I am. I can go down to four feet. I tend to gravitate towards the more manageable ones for my own yard. I know that Lucifer is a big plant. You put that at the back of a garden and see the flowers hanging over the top kind of thing. This is uh, Emily McKenzie. This is George Davidson. I can do these shorter ones now. It'll stay much more manageable that I don't have to necessarily, you know, tie up in a monster cage to try to keep them kind of upright a little bit, okay? Fortunately, my two little tyrants, my sons at my house, 
have flattened my clump in front of my kitchen. So I walked out there today and was like, all right, boys, <laughs> what's going on out here? And my big clump of orange is kind of laying flat because I think they walked through it, it was by accident, right? Yeah. Exactly. So here's three. I'll bring all three of these up. So anybody do euphorbia? You know, this is not a, a, a summer bloomer. I don't want to by any means, but we always throw a little bit of evergreen perennials kind of in with this discussion. This is a plant that would bloom over the winter, early spring to early summer kind of time frame. Right now, if you have them, you probably have the dried seed heads on there. Uh, they do go to seed. So when I do them in my yard, I try to deadhead them at some point so I don't have more euphorbias popping up everywhere. Some of these will go to seed quite a bit. Um, but I think you know you look at that foliage there's just a couple of choices beautiful foliage you know if i wanted an evergreen drought tolerant full sun perennial that i don't have to watch disappear in the winter this is a nice one to mix with a lot of the summer stuff because it fits in great with foliage then we get to next winter okay i still have a couple things left in there to catch my eye then we start to bloom early and then we go on to the next season of the summer so we have ones like this is silver swan with the lighter variegation We've got stuff like Ascot Rainbow is probably one of the more popular ones around here. And then we've got a whole bunch of dark ones. This is Blackbird. We've got Merlot. There's a little, little cute one called Rudolph. It's got a bright red little scarlet tip on the leaves. Um, but there's some beautiful little euphorbias out there to try as well. Yeah. What kind of companion plants would you put with those? Well, anything for kind of hot, dry again. I mean, I could literally probably go through all these and pick out um, just about everything we've got off on the table for sun, and that would fit in nicely, depending again, probably which one I chose. Because I mean, some of these euphorbias, you know, I'm gonna get a good three foot by three foot shrub look to, then I can pop off the front with something, you know, kind of on the border kind of deal. Yeah. Um, all right, so there's enough sun. Let me show you just a couple of shade things. Now I gotta stand off to the side. So I brought a couple shade things in because there are there is a lot that does bloom in the in the shade uh, through the summer. Now if I'm gonna go for flower power period, which one of those you think I'm gonna grab, Mr. Fuchsia? I mean that is hardy fuchsia. If I want bloom, hummingbird pollinator, all the things we're talking about today for shade or part shade. And these will take a little more sun than you probably think they will if you water. This is not drought tolerant when we get to fuchsia. But I could pick any color in the rainbow for sepal, Corolla color. We've got white on white, pink on red, pink on purple, red on purple. You go out there and look. There's a, a fabulous selection of hardy fuchsias around. But if I'm going for bloom, this is not going to be beat for the shade. If I want the longest season of flower, that's it right there. I'm going straight for a cool hardy fuchsia. Like we mentioned earlier, not one plant that I'm really excited about telling gardeners to get out in the fall and cut it back. That's when I leave the wood all through the winter. I'm out there first of April in the spring going, okay, you tell me where you want to start off this year. I see green coming off the wood everywhere. I can leave it tall if I want, or I can cut it back if I want, keep it smaller, and then off we go. And here we go, bloom again. I've got a really cool one. I like, I love foliage for me as my gardener. So I love yellow, especially in the shade. So I have one called Golden Gate, which we have out there, limey gold foliage with a red and purple flower. I just think it's a cool color in my yard. So I have one in a pot that's in my shade garden, kind of up on an old stump as an accent plant. I didn't think mine came back. I mean, it died to the pot. I had no wood of any kind left at all but I said no honey just wait a little bit I'm not gonna dump the pot out quite yet by April guess what off the root system here we come and right now I've got that much by that much and it's in full bloom again so just because you don't have wood left don't give up on those early they tend not to do much up here till we get into April especially this year with the abysmal spring weather right if we show you I'll we'll show you hostas that's another one I didn't put on my list, but probably could. I mean, hosta is a really easy plant to grow. I mean, you keep a little slugs off some of them here and there. I've got bloom, got pollinator action, got great foliage, and hosta is really drought tolerant. I mean, I've used some of these in places I did not think hosta would grow because I don't water a lot and they have thrived. So it looks like something I'd have to water that way too much to keep it looking healthy, but that's pretty drought tolerant for a perennial. Um, and really easy to grow. There is a zillion 
pastas out there. You can pick your own foliage color, lavender bloom, white flower, fragrant, not fragrant. I and mean, there's a lot of options for, for some cool hostas. This is one uh, called Colored Hulk, which is kind of fun. It's just kind of got the green like the Hulk, right? You get a couple different tones in there, and then we got a little, little shorter habit to that. If we look at a couple ferns, you know, again, evergreen ferns. We've got a lot of good perennial ferns down there. Not so much for the pollinators, but kind of for shade gardening. That's a great addition because um, they don't really flower. We get the little spores on the bottoms of the blades this time of year. Um, but we do have some great ferns down there if you're looking to add evergreen perennial to that, to that shade garden. So this is one called Japanese Autumn Fern. I've got a big clump of that in my shade garden. I've always got this color coming out on the new growth. And this is a nice sized fern. You get this growing, I'll have something up two, three feet in a really nice habit, but I never go totally dormant on that. I've always got some structure in the winter time. That's, that's an autumn fern from Japan. I think this is one of the coolest new plants on the property, period. This came out last year. It's this new Jurassic series fern. This one's called Jurassic Gold. You can see that picture. So when this leaves out in spring, I've got that color on my new growth and you can still see a little bit of that color tone on the new fronds. That's a really cool fern, I think, for a, for something with some structure. How tall does that get? I mean, uh, this just about a foot and a half. I mean, I'm not gonna get super outrageous on that one, but about a foot and a half. Yeah, so that's Jurassic Gold. I thought I had one more. Then I brought in the, one of the shield ferns here. Again, a little bit lower, but this again, I think I've got really interesting texture on that. Again, not drought tolerant when we talk ferns, they probably don't need as much water as you think they do. You've seen our native ferns out there in the woods everywhere. Uh, but when I give a little bit of water to in the summer, but something again, unless we get a really bad winter, I'm gonna have something evergreen that I can use in a shady border with, with the shield fern. If we look at two taller things for the shade, does anyone have snake root? Or act, they used to call that act, or Semissa fuga, they renamed it Actea. I refuse to say that, so we call <laughs> Let's call it snake root. How's that? But this is a really cool perennial. I mean, you, can you see that foliage? So that's, I'll put it up here. So that's purple. So that gives me a really tall perennial that's got purple leaves. I have two or three of these in different areas of my yard, and you can see the flower just starting. So this is super fragrant. When this flower opens, it looks like a snake. It'll come up, get really long, and kind of curve a little bit. And it's all white, but it's got great fragrance, and it's a very different flower, I think. But if again, I'm looking for a specimen perennial, you know, I have one in the sun, a little bit more sun, I have one in shade. If I find that spot where I can get like half day sun, half day shade, I'm gonna have that color leaf, which is very unusual in a perennial, with some height to it. If I put it in dark shade, which I have one in there, it leaves out this color. Then I've got a little more green during this time of year, a little bit of purple accent, but I still get bloom and it still gets nice size. So you can grow it either way. But that's a great woodland perennial. And again, when this is in bloom here, late summer, a great one for the pollinators as well. This is probably my favorite plant in my backyard for quite a few years. Anyone done, anyone done these perennial aurelias? It's giant. Yeah, this is a big plant. Mine's as big as me this year, and it is spectacular. So nothing in the winter, this dies of the ground. But this year with the wet spring, I was like, holy smokes, you're going quick. And literally, I have an old roadie that's I pruned up all the branches and turned it into a tree, and I've got a huge perennial garden underneath it. This is the yellow that provides the background for everything in the foreground kind of thing. We can divide that. You can divide it down the road. Um, you know, this is one that does bloom, but this is not till fall. So I'm going to see a kind of a different flower on this, more on the purple tones. Gets a little flower on it and actually a really cool berry as we get towards that October, November time frame. So it's great foliage in the summer. You would have a little late pollen interaction when it blooms late, late summer uh, into early fall. And it does get a cool berry. Then we get a hard frost like Thanksgiving. The whole thing just melts. I walk out, rake it off the ground, put it in the yard waste, and it's like, sweet, I'll see you again next spring kind of thing. Really easy plant. But if you like yellow foliage, I would highly recommend looking at one of these. And this doesn't have to be in deep, dark shade. If I put it in all shade, I'm going to get a little more green color to it. 
when I have mine sighted again shade 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 all day and then about four o'clock boom I get a blast of Sun when it's low in the sky or it could be the opposite I've got east side garden I get some morning Sun and then shade in the afternoon but that would give me that bright yellow lime color on the leaves a really I think a really impressive foliage plant I see something nibbling on the bottom which is what I have and I'm not sure it's slug, the slug probably slug. probably okay. slug well, yeah. I get tiny yellow spider uh, in lots of things hmm. um, about them. I, I, it yeah, bring, like they're destroying some of my ascoli. Send me a picture and we see okay. what it is. It, right. Spiders wouldn't eat leaves. If a spider might, it may. Yeah, okay. But those typically, that one, I'd say it's probably slug okay. more than more yeah, than, more than likely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just the last couple and we'll get you out of the heat down here. So anemones. Anyone got anemones? Anemones. That's always a tough tongue twister. Um, this is a... I'll, I'll smile when I say it. Uh, this is one that naturalizes very well. How's that for a pleasant? Yeah, we don't say, we can't use the word invasive, right? So we say it just naturalizes really nicely. Um, if you have an enemy, you're smiling too, because you plant one and, wow, I got like 12 and then I got 15. So if you want a yard where I want something to kind of naturalize in an area, especially in shade, an enemy is a great choice. I mean, I show you ours in the shade garden over here. And it just pops up where we don't have anything and sweet blooms in the fall it's got great for the bees late in the season uh, you can see the flower buds are just coming out right now the first couple are just beginning to bloom here in august um, but it's not you know i'm a little on the ocd side so it's hard for me when i like things in little clumps in a tidy order this one would not be that way how's that <laughs> so if you like the cottage garden you know kind of let things blend together that's a great choice there's some fabulous Anemones out there already. Uh, let's see, a stilby. Anyone got a stilby? Everyone asks us for astable. I would say, you mean a stilby? There you go. Um, you know, this is an easy plant to grow. I use these quite a bit in my yard. I've got a few different varieties. They're just about done blooming. This is kind of one for that June, July, you know, kind of time frame. The biggest thing with this is wet. You know, this is one that we can have a little wet and we do want to keep wet. This is the opposite of drought tolerant. If I put this in my yard and I don't water much, you're gonna to struggle to get bloom on it, A, and B, it's probably gonna go dormant early every year. If you keep this watered, I mean, I've seen a still be look like a shrub, you know, as we get into early summer. It'd have a nice structure, great foliage, and, and a great flower as well, but we have to keep this one watered, okay? just got a couple left here so again nothing about summer but look at that hell I brought a hellebore in here so anyone have hellebores Lenten roses you know it, it's a perennial it doesn't bloom till winter um, this is you know right after the holidays typically but it's evergreen and I always think it's worth mentioning in perennial class because a at the top of the drought tolerant list dry shade essential you know if I've got a shade garden and it's dry underneath a cedar a dug fir it doesn't soak up much water this is a the top of the list for choice it's evergreen it's low it's nice and bushy they're really easy to grow and you're going to get flowers um in a time of year nothing else is blooming in the yard i mean it's nice to walk out at christmas and january and february and go holy smokes i got flowers out early bees will help a little bit uh, when we get to that time of year but the reason i brought it in now is foliage you know, I may not have bloom here for months, but if you look at these new varieties, I mean, look at that beautiful leaf. All of them have variegation now, modeling. I'll have a great flower. You can find that on any hellebore, but pick one out this time of year. We start to get a few in and a whole bunch in fall if you like the leaf because the flowers there for three, four months, the other eight months, I'm looking at the foliage. So if you go, wow, that's a really cool leaf. I can see that in this area in my yard you're gonna be happy with the plant and then the flowers will be a nice bonus over the over the holidays. Would, yes? Would you suggest, uh, are there types of hellebores for full sun? Um, you can grow hellebores in a lot more sun than I think you, than you think you can. I mean, I'm up to the point where I'm probably sun up till two o'clock on a couple of my clumps and never have burn, they never look tired, it's not, they're, they're just fine. Um, I don't know that I go all day afternoon sun with any of them, to be honest with you, but you can have six, eight hours all morning for sure. And I don't even mind up till early afternoon, but I'm gonna, if I'm gonna do that, then I'm gonna have a little shade late in the day. I could go the opposite 
shade, 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 and then I could get the late afternoon, evening sun. I'm okay with that too. Okay. Um, last couple. What did I forget here? Ooh, last two here. So, anyone do ligularia? You get a couple. Now, do you have old-fashioned ligularia, big leaves? I just got it this year. Did you get? Did you get? Bigger leaf. Okay. Yeah, it's very so the slugs, the slugs will like them a little bit. They like mine too. Um, I've got a couple different kinds. In fact, you can see one, one slug got a leaf on that one. Yeah. Um, Ligularia, if we do a little slug bait, you'll keep the foliage clean. Um, but it's a pretty cool perennial. If we go to the opposite end again, where I have wet, I have maybe the, not the best drainage. Ligularia will take some wet. We have to water them a little bit more. But if you got moist soil, you, they kind of got it taken care of for you. Um, it's a foliage plant. This is one called Pandora. This is a new one I picked up last year and I have this if You want to know my garden design? There's my combination where I found a home for that So I have a six-foot aurelia that I planted three of these Pandoras on the border because I had looked for something God, I like something dark right there and it, it looks very striking in the garden um, if I have again little bit of sun the more sun the darker the leaf i'm going to have this doesn't have to be in deep dark shade it still looks cool but i'm going to have a little more green with the purple um this is just new because it's short typical ligularia got pretty good size my old one uh, that i got years ago it's an old one called brit marie crawford you'll see around the rockets another one there's a bunch bigger leaves they're always round like that look very cool but now i'm going to be up that tall with a flower stalk on top of that so again that one's more in the background in my own garden not on the border kind of thing but they'll get a little stalk looks like a daisy flower a little bit but it's kind of orangey goldy yellow and those color tones they do bloom late summer so another great one for the pollinators um, but it's but a pretty sweet foliage too if you like something a little different 